At Cambridge Trust, we believe that living well is about more than just managing your wealth. It's about staying intrigued, informed, and inspired. I'm Michael Duca, Executive Vice President at Cambridge Trust Company. And this is the Cambridge Trust Thought Series. I'm Dr. Irene Pepperberg. Right now I'm a research associate at Harvard in the Department of Psychology. I became interested in birds at a very young age, actually. I grew up in Brooklyn, above a store. There were no children around to play with. And my dad bought me a little budgerigar, the little green parakeets you get at Woolworths. So literally, I mean, the bird was my companion. And I think I imprinted on this little budgie. And that really started it. I you know, went to MIT. I got my degree in chemistry. I went to Harvard, was getting my degree in theoretical chemistry. And the first year of NOVA started. And I saw for the first time that animal behavior was a science, that I could study animals and still be a scientist. And that just changed my life. When I talk about animal intelligence, I personally like to call it animal cognition. And it's the way that animals take in information, process information, and then use it in order to solve problems, whether they're problems in the wild or problems in the laboratory. So it's how they basically figure things out. Sometimes they have to figure out the nature of the problem, and that makes it even more exciting for them. So we try to challenge them. We try to do some things that are interesting for them. And by solving these problems, they show us how smart they are. Studying animal intelligence is just an amazing topic. The more we study, the more we find that these animals have amazing abilities. And the real trick is designing the experiments to take advantage of their physical capabilities. We train our birds through a modeling technique in which two people demonstrate to the bird what we want them to do. So for example, if I wanted to teach you the label for, say, a piece of wood, and you were a parrot, I would have you sit on a perch, I'd show you a favorite piece of wood that you like to chew, and then I'd show the wood to one of my assistants and ask her, you know, what's this? What matter? She'd say wood, and I'd say, that's good, good girl, here it is. And she'd get to play with it and say, wood, 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 is she tearing apart? She's having fun with the birds looking, kind of falling off the perch because the bird wants his toy. And then we exchange roles of model rival and trainer. So the bird sees that one person is not always the questioner and the other the respondent. And she asks it to me. And I go, er, and she goes, no, you're wrong. And this is really important because the bird sees that not any weird noise caused transfer of the object. So I get a second chance. Now I say wood. I get to play with it, tear it apart. You know, and we go back and forth several times. We'll then show it to the bird, and the bird gets a chance. And because it's very difficult for them to learn to use all the different muscles that they need to use to say it's a wood, word like wood in English, they're not going to say it right away. But they might say something like, Oot! and we'll go, okay, that's the uh sound, and we'll reward that initially, and then work on you know, shaping up the exact pronunciation later on. It was during our um, spring demo period where all the CEOs of different companies come to see what we're doing in the lab, and word got out that there was a live parrot to come visit. But they wanted to see Alex do phonemes, the sounds of speech. And went, okay, you know, you guys get what you want. So we set up the tray, and it was basically the refrigerator letters that the children use in different colors. And the task was, you know, what sound is blue? And if it was an SH, Alex would say, shh. And we'd say, good birdie, you're right. And by this time, chewing on these letters was no longer any fun, so he wanted to get a different reward. He wanted a nut. But I, you know, I only have five minutes with these people. I don't want him sitting there chewing nuts for all this time. So I said, well, just wait. We'll get it. So I'm asking him questions. And each time I ask him a question and he answers it correctly, you know, what sound is blue? What color is, you know, mm? He said, want a nut? And he's getting more and more obstreperous. It's like, want a nut? And he's really getting like that. And finally, he looks at me and he goes, want a nut, n a t And the, I, I almost dropped the tray because 
not only had he, you know, done this to, to sort of say, you know, hey, stupid, you know, would I have to spell it out for you? But he didn't know the uh sound. He was never trained on the uh sound. He was trained on the n and the t, and he figured out the uh sound by himself. So that was pretty remarkable. Well, Alex used to make up certain words or phrases sometimes, and sometimes they were kind of weird. So like he, first time we were working with the word apple, and the put is tough, think about with lips, you know, without lips. So he came up with the term banary, banana cherry. It looked like a big, you know, cherry, and it kind of tasted like a banana. And then one time we'd given him a piece of cake, which was very sweet, and he knew the word for bread, and he knew the word yummy, and this time he looks at us and goes, yummy, bread. So he put these things together in a really interesting way. Well, the question always comes when I give talks, or, you know, well, the bird's just mimicking. And the point is the bird is mimicking the sounds of speech. That is correct. But he's using those sounds in a referential manner. So he learns to identify different objects. We know that he understands the words. We know that it's not just mimicking, because you could pull something out of your pocket and ask him, what color, what shape, what matter? And he'd answer all those questions about that object. And that's not something he could do if he were just mimicking something. We can hold two things up and say, you know, what color bigger, what color smaller? What matter bigger, what matter smaller? And again, taking two things out of your pocket and asking those types of questions, that's only something that an animal that understands the meaning of those labels could answer. We really need to understand the intelligence of animals. We need to understand it because we share the world with them. And the only way we really pay attention to conserving these animals is by looking at them and understanding how they are similar to us. It's, it's a sad reflection on us that we can't empathize as much with animals with whom we can't see similarities. But this is a fact of life. And the more that I can show people how intelligent these birds are, the better chance there will be of conserving their areas in, whether it's Africa or in Indonesia or South America, of treating them properly as pets. And the other thing is that we find that we can use them as models for intervention. So there are some studies that we published a number of years ago showing how that modeling technique we use for the birds can be used for children with, on the autism spectrum and try to establish some level of communication system with them. So there are a lot of these reasons for looking at animal intelligence and studying it. Thank you for joining us for this presentation of the Cambridge Trust Thought Series. For more Thought Series events, podcasts, articles, and videos, please visit cambridgetrust.com.